Hi, I'm, uh, I'm working on a short book at the moment, one of the series of Social Age Guidebooks, which is a series of leadership reflections from the Apollo moon landings at 50 years. And I thought, uh, as I'm at home today, I'm just in my office trying to finish the book this week, I'd share a bit of an update on it and perhaps just read you one of the uh, chapters, the introductions, just to um, kind of go through what I'm trying to achieve with it and, and share some of where I'm at with it at the moment. I've been in, really interested in the moon landings from a technical perspective for a long time, but I wasn't really sure how to draw together a piece of work that would share some of the most interesting human and technical stories and provide some broad reflections on leadership without it being really cheesy. So I didn't want it, I don't want to write something which is a really rubbish reflection on what we can take away from this grand program. I wanted it to be um, quite meaningful. I, I can't go so far as to say applied um, because it's a reflection. So I guess the best I can say is this is a story about some of the most interesting features of the Apollo program and it's my personal reflections on what that means for leadership. So let me read you a bit of it and then perhaps I'll try to add some context around it. So this is the introduction at the moment, it's still a draft. 50 years ago, the Apollo program put a man on the moon. Alongside the Manhattan Project, which had delivered the atomic bomb, it was probably the most complex and ambitious mobilization of state and science that the world's ever seen. It was a vast overreach of effort to achieve the aspiration required the invention and mastery of new technologies alongside the systems of scheduling and control to use them. In fact, as a side note, that was one of the things I was most interested in uh, that came across strongly in um, some of the reading about building the lunar lander itself, is it wasn't just the technical challenge. They actually had to invent some of the systems of resource management and project scheduling. You know, sort of project management discipline grew significantly out of this work. Anyway, so from project management to computer simulation, new disciplines emerged, and all of which in remarkably short order. And again, that's one of the features I look at in, in I've written a whole chapter on simulation and testing, which is that um, the, the Apollo simulation computers, which are all mainframes, created the very first visualization of a, a real landscape on a computer screen, so to, to model the actual landing process itself. Apollo famously gave us Velcro as well as the pen that can write in zero gravity, but much more too. It provides insight into humility and failure and the limits of political power and exactly what we mean by the right stuff. So I, I wrote that. Um, the humility and failure bit is interesting. I was very, um, I guess, moved by reading Buzz Aldrin's autobiography. In a rather strange way, he, he comes, he doesn't come out from it as the most likeable character but then I guess if you're looking for pioneers willing to sit on top of uh, a device with a something like a 20th of the explosive power of the um, Hiroshima bomb you, you, you don't necessarily need somebody who is who is nice and likeable you need somebody with the right stuff um, but Aldrin's autobiography tells a very interesting story of his military career and his move into the Apollo program but then his subsequent descent into alcoholism and striving to find purpose after uh, Apollo had ended. And it's a very human story. Um, if you contrast that with Neil Armstrong's story, where he really, um, I wouldn't say he became a hermit, but he certainly retreated and held a sort of a very dignified, but also very distant um, space after uh, Apollo. It is interesting. The humility and failure I try to explore in some of the subsequent chapters. So there is one chapter about Apollo 1, which was the capsule which caught fire on the launch pad and three of the astronauts uh, died in that. And that's a story about really arrogance and, and, and humility. And it talks about systemic um, arrogance, the arrogance of systems as well as the arrogance of individuals, our belief that we have mastery over technology. Anyway. Apollo is a story told on many levels. On the one hand, it's the story of a nation and an extension of the geopolitical struggle that nearly rained atomic fire on the world. But on the other, it's a very human story of complexity, risk, bravery and determination, tragedy, alcoholism and loss. 
it's a timely moment to revisit Apollo, as after a 50-year hiatus of real purpose, we're at the start of a new chapter heralded by an evolved relationship between state actors and the emergent transnationals, which is slashing the costs of launch and delivering on what was the hollow promise of legacy and reusability. The Moon, Mars and beyond all feel slightly more within our reach. Now that's um, something which I don't explore in great detail in the book. I don't touch at all upon um, upon Elon Musk and uh, his race for Mars um, and the, the, the modern moonshot programs, although I will touch in those on some subsequent blog posts. But there is a really interesting notion which Oliver Morton explores in his book um, more recent book, uh, just called The Moon, which is about the sort of the, the tragedy of Apollo, the wasted legacy. Um, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting aspect of the program, really, that it's taken us 50 years to take the second step. Anyway, the foundations of Apollo were in the literature, the dreamers, philosophers, and pioneering science fiction writers who coalesced into the various rocketry societies, but it was the two world wars that lit the fuse. Rocketry was not specifically outlawed in Germany as part of the armistice in 1918, whilst general weapons development was, largely because nobody could see the link. They didn't, uh, they didn't understand that connection. The risk was an unknown unknown. I'm using that language that I've used previously in the writing about black swans, unknown unknown types of events. The interwar years therefore created a space for curiosity in a time of ambiguity, Two factors that may provide the solution to much of the innovation crisis felt in established organisations today. It's the control over curiosity and almost pathological fear of curiosity that kills a learning culture and leads directly to failure. And again, that's um, an interesting thing for me. It's curiosity in a time of ambiguity. So it's not just rampant curiosity itself, and nor is it specifically... Um, funding and resourcing of curiosity. It's that time of ambiguity, so a sense of potential um, in a space of unknown constraint. That's a really interesting dynamic I try to explore in my own work on innovation, um, but is a real feature of the Apollo program. Of course, the Second World War provided a stimulus to deploy, and von Braun's rockets did just that, hefting high explosive onto London, but even as the first V2 rockets took off, von Braun saw it not as the end of a war, but the first step on a journey to the stars. And that's an interesting part of the, the story of the rocket scientists, uh, the German rocket scientists, who were hoovered up after the war by both Russia and the US, who tried to sort of grab that expertise. They tried to take not just factories, but ex ex um, extant teams of individuals and, and really... Um, Werner von Braun's rocketry team formed the heart of the uh, Apollo, well, the Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo programs, and indeed with a legacy right through to the shuttle program. The end of the war saw the wholesale pillaging of technology into intact teams, whilst both Russia and the US raced for supremacy, and the Apollo program included at heart the full intact German cadre and even some hardware. If Apollo was anything, it was incremental each successive launch mastering one new element in a complex interplay of technology and a complex power struggle against Russia, giving the whole thing a rather unusual dynamic that it was perfectly possible to be technologically superior, but still to lose control of the narrative by simply being a few weeks too late. Uh, Sputnik, the first satellite that Russia lofted into orbit and pinged its story of threat and fear into the heart of the US, demonstrated that with dynamic effect. Suddenly, distance collapsed. It's quite interesting, I was talking to my mother the other day about Sputnik and she said, oh yes, we uh, lived in Norfolk at the time and she described uh, after school going down to the beach at night with her best friend to watch Sputnik going over because um, Sputnik was highly polished silver and it was in a low enough orbit that you could see it. And of course, in those times, there were no other satellites. So today, if you go out and look at the night skies, it's easy to see satellites or indeed the space station um, going past because of the way they flicker and the way that they move. You can see them easily. But this was the first one. And it rather surprised me when she said that. Yeah, they went down to watch it going over, obviously without the sense of dread that it brought uh, to America, which was, well, if you can throw a satellite to go over us, beaming out its message of 
here I am, here I am, uh, you can, of course, project a bomb or another weapon platform over it. Um, it's interesting how the early stages of um, the space race were very much about fear and the projection of fear. Uh, I explore a different angle of that in one of the subsequent chapters in this book, looking at Apollo as storytelling, because for the first time, Apollo had dynamic real-time storytelling, the broadcasts from the spaceship, the broadcasts from the launch. So in, in some ways, Apollo is very much a curated story of power. Um, the Saturn V rockets that delivered Apollo remain to this day about the most complex machines ever built by humans and staggeringly powerful. The first minutes of launch deposited the power of a nation through the five thrusters. It's easy to become lost in the hyperbole, but at heart, Apollo was a human venture. The three astronauts who died consumed by fire on the launch pad in Apollo 1 died because of stupidity and arrogance, much like the Challenger astronauts died decades later. Technology cannot compete with arrogance of control systems. That's probably slightly harsh. I might tone that back slightly, but there is a sense of it, actually. The risks of the pure oxygen, high-pressure atmosphere used in Apollo 1 were known risks, and it was unnecessary to be using that atmosphere, and yet it persisted. And it's one of the ideas I've explored in work on um, failure, the failure of systems, is the notion of frames and narratives persisting, even though the majority of people know that they are wrong. Frames persist, narratives persist. Uh, and so there's a lot to take out of um, the, the failures of Apollo as well as the successes. Every meta-narrative of Apollo can be broken down into micro ones, the ways that every component works together, the ways that problems were solved, the insights and revelations felt by the men who walked in space and on the surface of the moon. I do believe that in its soul, the story of Apollo is one of fragility and humanity, and hence one that we can learn from, if not directly, then through reflection. I've wanted to write about Apollo for some time, and I've filled a whole shelf in my library with various biographies, technical publications, and pulp fictions about the programme. I became simply more daunted by the idea. The driving idea for me is that we can use a reflection upon the Apollo programme as the foundation of a broad reflection on leadership today. It can form one of the lenses that I've talked about previously, um, different ways of looking at the world. But it comes with the risk of being rubbish. The last thing I want to do is draw crass lessons of leadership and bravery from Neil Armstrong, Collins and Aldrin as they navigated the vacuum. I, I, you know, my writing may fall into that in places, but I've tried to pull the hyperbole uh, and nonsense out of it. Um, instead, I've taken a rather selfish approach at heart, the appeal for me is in the really rather fascinating details of the technology and the programme, understanding the sequence and progression of development, learning something about the complexity and genius of the engineering, hearing some of the very human fallibilities and failings along the way, and just enjoying the sheer magnitude and majesty of what may be the greatest adventure story ever told. So there I am, falling into hyperbole almost immediately. Um, I'm sharing this in the format of one of my social age guidebooks. They all work to a common format. They share uh, some of the, the research and content, but also include sections that are my own attempt to draw out the meaning. So in this case, I've written my leadership reflections against each area. And then I say, you know, mine may not be the same as yours, which is fine. They're shared as part of my reflective journey, and I hope that people will build their own reflections out for theirs. Um, and then I, I, I just uh, say a little more about the, the time scale that I'm working to. So um, this is it. I, I've still not settled on the final title. Uh, titles of books can be tricky, but it will probably be Leadership Reflections from Apollo. Um, you know, it's Lessons from the Space Race, but I, I want to get that Leadership Reflections into the title. Uh, I'm doing pretty well with it. I've, uh, I'm probably 80% there with the writing. Today I'm going to write some short uh, bridging sections. There are a few bits that warrant uh, a story being told but don't warrant a whole chapter. So I'm going to work on those. And then I'm probably going to write one full chapter on Apollo 13, which was the, the mission that famously went wrong and was made into the film by Tom Hanks. Although I may leave that out. Um, one of the features of the Social Age guidebooks that I've really tried to stick to is they're all 10,000 words or under. And they're uh, I'm already at 10,000 words, and a chapter, chapter on Apollo 13 will be 1,500 to 2,000 words. So 
I'll see. It's a good story, but uh, maybe I need to save it for another day. Uh, as with all of the guidebooks, this isn't my... Um, I, I cheat with these. They're somewhere between blog posts and a full book. So the social age guidebooks can iterate fast. So I reserve the right to put out another uh, book on Apollo, which will have some extra detail in it later. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it and uh, do share any comments, thoughts or reflections. Thank you.